when he settled into his new United Kingdom, King James I had a lot of stuff to take care of. One of which, as every schoolboy and schoolgirl knows, was to design a new national flag when it became obvious that the Cross of St George would be stuck on top of the Cross of St Andrew, the saltire. A group led by the Earl of Mar lobbied for it to be done the other way it wasn't. If you try it for yourself, it looks like the Cross of St George has been X'd out. For years, some Scottish ships flew flags that looked like this, which could ruffle some feelings. Tim Marshall's new book, Worth Dying For, digs into the power and the politics of flags. And when I talked to Tim earlier, I asked him to remind me where the saltire comes from. As you know, I hope. Um, (laughs) There was King Angus, uh, about to go into battle, uh, as you do. And um, things weren't going that well, and he was a little bit worried. And so he looked up at the sky, did King Angus, and, and, and there was the cross... Of St Andrew, this white cross on a clear blue sky. And um, as you may know, if you know your scripture, St Andrew was supposed to have been crucified on an X-shaped cross. And because he then led them into battle, uh, King Angus, that became the sort of Scottish symbol. And it t- that was about well, roughly 8th, 9th century. By 1286... It was being used on the seals of the Scottish government and ever since. It's a, it's a wonderful story, this story about the Earl of Mar saying, are you sure you've got it the right way around? Couldn't the cross <laughs> of St Andrew go yeah. on top? Well, there, there we fast forward to the, um, the Act of Union, 1707. And, yeah, you know, you, new country needs a new flag. Now, there'd, there'd been a version of the Union Jack, and, yes, it can be called that. Um, oh, yeah. before 1707. But, yeah, you know, they needed an official flag. Now, obviously, if you're from Scotland, you're looking at this flag and you're putting the white cross on the top of the red cross. But it might not be seen that way a few hundred miles further south. And there was this, uh, luckily, simply diplomatic battle royale, and uh, it came out, well, it came out the way we, we now know it, more or less... And um, that red cross is slightly, perhaps, to, to the fore. But uh, m- my personal view is I just love the way it's all stitched together. You said there's a, there's a question about the Union Jack and calling it the Union yeah. Jack. Uh, there, there's quite a kind of detailed argument about this, isn't there? There is. Um, uh, but it comes down to get over yourself. Uh, which is my uh-huh. sh- shorthand. I went to the Flag Institute and, and, and went into it in some depth with them, and they, they do take the view, look, that's what we all know it as. Yes, you can come up with your historical evidence and I can come up with my historical evidence, but they have come up with some very, very good historical evidence, including proclamations in Parliament, including proclamations at the Admiralty, that, yes, hundreds of years ago, there was a, a wee jack on a ship and it was a pole for one of the smaller of the flags, and the nation-state flag flew from it. So that flag flew from the jack, and that was therefore the Union Jack. But it came into popular use, and the Flag Institute, in its wisdom, and I think using common sense, says, look, if that is its popular use, and I mean popular in all sense of the words, that's what we can call it. And is the Flag Institute the closest thing that the world of flags has to the College of Heralds who decide on whether Donald Trump can have a (laughs) certain coat of arms? They are, and they're actually world leaders. I mean, perhaps that's not a surprise because heraldry and the nation-state flags springs from this part of the world. But they really, they are acknowledged. I mean, there's a couple of American, they're called vexillologists, people that uh, study flags, and I'm not one of them. And, and they are the sort of doyens of vexillology uh, of the world. I went to their annual general meeting last year. Absolutely. The things you can learn about flags. It's amazing. It, this all reminds me of one of the old I Spy books. I'm sure there was an I Spy book of flags, and you got so many points for, for spotting different flags, didn't well, you? It, well, I, I'm an anorak, and I'm afraid as a, as a child, um, instead of going out and smashing up phone boxes, I, I was learning, you know, the capital of, capitals of the world and the flags and stuff. Still being in great stead later on, mind. <laughs> Bit of uh, Boy Scout lore, by the way. How, how do you know if the, uh, our flag, the Union Jack, is being flown as a distress sign? Um, as it has been, um, when it's flown upside down, 
which people do usually by mistake, but not always, you're mm -hmm. supposed to only fly it upside down, which is when the broad white stripe is not at the top. Uh, it's actually at the bottom. And um, I do remember the day after Brexit, uh, the Union flag at Brussels, along with the other 27 nation-state flags, was flying upside down. And to this day, no one knows if someone was having a laugh or that it was a genuine mistake. It's a, it's a fascinating thing, isn't it? But if you've been in the, in the Scouts or, or something like that, some other, you know, paramilitary, quasi, <laughs> quasi military organisation, don't write to me, um, I, you know, you know that there's only one right way to put the flag. And if you have one of these pillows with the flag on it, it drives me crazy if I see this thing the wrong way up. I bet you're a spelling enthusiast as well, aren't you? Yes, I am. It's yeah, I mean, terrible. Myself too. Terrible. No, I, I, can you're you, right. I mean, can you abuse the flag? You know, there was all this row in the 60s, wasn't it, about people putting the Union mm. Jack on underpants? Well, yeah, I've got a photograph of myself hitchhiking across America in, in the 1980s, and I'm wearing a pair of Union, Union Jack shorts, and I'm thinking, ooh, I'm not sure, because in America, no way it's actually against the law. I think you can. I think you can desecrate it. Uh, I think you have the right to because I think it's the very freedoms that it's supposed to stand for that therefore allows you to desecrate it. If I could quickly move on to the Stars and Stripes. The Please good, do. The, well, the story about that, well, along with many others, in the 60s during the Vietnam War and the 70s, it was getting burnt a lot, and I think it was Nixon made it illegal to burn it, to desecrate it. And then in the 1984, a young Texan student burnt it, was sentenced to a year in jail, appealed took three years to get to the Supreme Court, and he was, it was found that he had not broken the law because the law was wrong, because the law, and this is a really interesting bit, the law was in breach of the right to free speech. Their justices in their wisdom said, the flag speaks to you, and you speak to it, and by burning it, you are saying something. Consequently, as you have the right to free speech, you have the right to burn it, and ever since then, you can legally burn the flag of the United States, but not of several other countries. The flag code of the United States mm. is so deep and complex, isn't it? You're, you're now something of an expert on all the things well. that you can and can't do with the American flag. Yeah, uh, it, and it's almost scary at times. They, they take their flag more overtly seriously than, than many nations. Not, not all, yeah. but many. And the, the flag code... I mean, look, once you get the military get hold of something, they will write several, several pages of rules and regulations about it. But there is also some beauty to parts of the code. Um, I've been to Arlington Cemetery to see the uh, to, 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 to attend the um, ceremonies of some of the Marines that have died in Afghanistan, and they fold the flag into a uh, triangular shape. Every fold has a symbolic meaning about the meaning of life and death and sacrifice. And the very last fold is the, the, the daylight, and it's a white bit of it. It's folded into the stars of night. Now, that point, it is in the shape of the cockade hats that they wore when they fought the British in the War of Revolution uh, to get rid of the British for democracy's sake. And so, you know, it all comes together, that sort of symbolism. Now, a lot of people, you know, you can, you can have a, a view on whether you think that's taking things too far or not, but the point is, it's there, and for many people, it means a great deal. And, and for anybody who has been a, a serving soldier and is entitled mm. to a military escort, that same flag folding is done at the funeral. And then uh, the flag in a little triangular wooden case yeah. all glassed in is handed over to the widow. It's a very powerful moment, I think. It, it's very powerful. And again, it goes to the idea of sacrifice. I mean, again, you know, the, the, the book is called Worth Dying For, to be provocative. It could have had a question mark. It is a question. Is it worth dying for? And I think the answer is it depends on the flag and the person. You know, if you believe that this flag represents something that you believe in, let's say it's your nation state and you like the way your nation state is acting and somebody from outside comes to destroy that way of life, you can say, well, I think the fellow next door should see them off, or you can say, I'm going to see them off as well. And if it all goes horribly wrong... Well, at that point, you've made a sacrifice. Um, and again, it's, it's up to your own opinion whether you think a flag is worth dying for. But the real question is if you think an idea is worth dying for, because a flag essentially is an idea. 
But that, that, that really gets to the, the, the basis of the whole thing, doesn't yeah. it? Because you march under a flag, and, and a flag is essentially, first and foremost, it's a sign of, of your preparedness to be with your tribe against somebody else's tribe. Yeah, it's, it's the bottom line. It doesn't always make it wrong. M- Mrs Clinton had a book out, a very successful one, called It Takes a Village, and it was all about local community. I, I happen to agree with her. It does take a village, but I take it further. It also takes a town, a city and a nation. And again, the nation-state was beginning to go out of fashion. I think it's come right back. And there are obviously very negative things about nation-states and nationalism. Um, I was just at a conference in Sweden, actually, last week, and, and the whole debate was about the difference between patriotism, where you have a love of one's own and a respect for others, as opposed to nationalism, hard nationalism, where you have a love of one's own and a contempt for everybody else. I mean, and there is a real difference between those two things. If you do have a love of one's own and it is represented by a symbol... Um, I don't see the problem with having an affinity with that signal. But, of course, it's... Uh, symbol, sorry. It's, you know, it's all about the time, the place, the person and the idea because there were people, of course, that wanted to fight under the swastika and felt that that was worth dying for, mm-hmm. not a view most of us hold. No, indeed, but as, as you mentioned it, the swastika is actually a very old symbol indeed. Yeah, isn't it? Uh, this was fascinating when I came across this. The, 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 um, there's an American, he went to the Chinese Book of Silk and in it, which is 3,000 years old, in it there's a picture of a comet and the comet's flying through space and the tail spin of it is in this, this, the shape of what we now call a swastika. The theory goes that in the ancient world, especially with the stars being able to be seen all the time, mankind saw these comets frequently. They were frequently spinning in the shape of a swastika, therefore it became a sign of something amazing. In the Hindu culture, it became a, a religious symbol and a, and a, and a good symbol. It was the Nazis, because, because the whole sort of Aryan nation stuff comes out of the Indus Valley civilization. they inverted it, took it into their warped ideals and turned it into what we know as the swastika the other way around. And, of course, it became a symbol of absolute evil in our culture, and it's still a bit of a shock. If you travel over to India and some of the other uh, eastern countries, you, know, you, you turn a corner and there's the swastika but it means something completely different. St Joan uh, had a banner, didn't she? And, uh, and she said something really very deep about her banner. Well, you're miles ahead of me because, you see, you've got notes there. I've and got I notes. Wrote... I, she said... <laughs> Thank you. She said that she prized the banner more than her sword. That's right. The famous sword of St Joan. Um, and, and I suppose Shaw was getting at that too, wasn't he, when he, when he wrote his play about her? Yeah, and, and again, this does go back to the ideas. Um, you know, she was prepared to die for the idea and that her banner, which is what she was fighting for, yes, that it was more important than her sword, more important than anything. And again, you know, you lose some people at this point because some people hate nationalism for, for very obvious reasons. But I, I come back to it. It, it, is, it is what it stands for. I'm reminded that the book opens, actually, the introduction um, with a quote by the US Secretary of the Interior uh, in 1914. Now, he was having a conversation with a flag, but don't let that put you off. He, <laughs> he wrote this little pamphlet, the American flag in conversation, but he said, I am no more than what you believe me to be, and I'm all that you believe I can be. And there's this two-way process, a bit like a painting. It does say something to you, but you also bring something to, to it. So the meaning of the flag, you know, it could be different to what, for one person to another. Um, I'll give you an example, the EU flag, loved by many, many people around Europe, standing for a sort of unity that they believe in. There's a lot of people in Greece with 50% youth unemployment and austerity they believe in forced upon them by Berlin, which they see as the capital of the EU, and that flag is not to them this great symbol of unity. You know, it's, it's quite an oppressive symbol. So it, it, it really is, a lot of it is, 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 is in the eye of the beholder. There's a wealth of, of stuff, of course, about flags and football. And uh, mm. you, you mentioned a Pew survey, I think, uh, of, of attitudes. But you also mentioned, famously, the 1966 World <sighs> Cup, which England were playing 
and everybody was waving the Union Jack. Nobody yes. was waving the Cross yeah. of St George. I'd never thought about it before, and then for the research of the book, I forced myself to watch that famous victory and thoroughly enjoyed it. Bobby Moore, what a player. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, but I, because I was watching it for that reason, I was really struck that... In all the footage, it's a sea of the Union Jack. And, of course, Britain weren't playing football that day. And there were very, very few of Cross of St George's. Now, forgive me for this, but in the extraordinarily unlikely event of Scotland ever getting to a World Mm -hmm. Cup final, Mm -hmm. I would like Mm -hmm. to see it happen. I just find it rather unlikely. uh, Yes. You've lost a generation of people like Bremner and Lorimer and Eddie Gray, and you don't seem to have replaced them. But I digress. It would be a sea of the salt here and, and the lion. There wouldn't be a Union Jack in the stadium. And so I think in, clearly in the mid-1960s for the English, the Union flag and the St George flag were sort of one and the same thing, um, which, of course, is quite insulting. And I, I think we have actually educated ourselves since those days. Both of those flags then got partially hijacked in the 70s and 80s by the far right, uh, particularly in England. We then rescued it in the 1996 Euro finals. You'll remember England played Scotland at Wembley and Gaz Scoyne scored that rather good goal. And at that point, the stadium, well, the sort of quarter of it that the England fans had, uh, fans uh, were occupying, was a sea of St George's crosses. And we had rescued the flag and we'd also understood the flag of England is not the flag of Britain, and you have to respect the different nations. I think we've come a long way, although you might argue we've still got some way to go. Ah, well, ah, well. And I might just say it was nearly 2 1, and um, so we have <laughs> no, to be No, no, there was a 93rd minute. Go- if you're talking about last Saturday. I am, of okay. course. <laughs> well, yeah. you play to the final whistle. Well, there was a moment when, uh, when things were looking rather different from the final result. Anyway, we'll yeah, pass, I'm a big fan we'll of pass on. Yes, We'll pass on, on um, to another football field in Belgrade mm. in the year 2014 when things really did get out of hand over yeah. a flag. You know, uh, people often say, you know, you can't understand America if you don't understand baseball. I, I, I think it's hard to f- truly understand Britain unless you understand football. But I think everywhere, well, everywhere I go uh, that plays football, I always make sure... I get across their myths and legends because you learn so much about the country from that. Um, And in Serbia, uh, for example, I I covered a lot of the Balkan Wars and the Milosevic overthrow. It was a chant that came off the terraces in Belgrade, which is something like um, Slobby, Slobby, Ubele, which basically meant Slobodan, Milosevic, go and kill yourself. And it mm. came off the terraces and went onto the streets and became the chant that helped to get rid of him. I'm, I'm digressing to make the point about the terraces are actually worth watching. So there's Serbia and Albania after the Kosovo War playing football, trying to get together. This was actually a diplomatic match, essentially. And uh, an Albanian fan who wasn't allowed to go, none of them were because there would have been even more violence, he got a drone, he attached the Albanian, greater Albanian flag, I should say, which includes lots of bits of Serbia, and he flew it into the centre circle. Serbian player tried to snatch it. He says he was simply going to try and take it away from the pitch and get on with it. Albanian players attacked him. Boom. Mass rioting. Stadium smashed up batch abandoned and a diplomatic incident over a small piece of cloth flown at a football match. But, of course, hey, making the point again, it's about so much more than just a piece of cloth. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we haven't really talked much about the, uh, about the Stars and Stripes, other than, of mm-hmm. course, about the, the protocol surrounding it. But uh, the old legends about Betsy Ross and the Stars and Stripes are looking a bit rocky these days. Yes, but Bessie Ross allegedly partially designed it and then sewed it together uh, after, the, after the Revolutionary War to get rid of the Brits. I'm not sure it matters. I, th- I, th- I think yeah. it, when it comes to things like this, I'm not saying that re- perception is reality, but legends and myths become to be seen to be true. And so the founding legends of a nation... Uh, are perceived as reality by many people in it. I mean, not not a flag um, example, but Dunkirk. I mean, Dunkirk in our country was a massive, catastrophic military failure where the entire British Expeditionary Force was forced onto the beaches and then had to run away 
Now, we came back, don't get me wrong, but we have turned that legend into something positive about the Dunkirk spirit and the, and the right. Dunkirk uh, And, of, and a very big movie uh, this yes. summer. Yes, I've, yes, I've seen it several times. Sorry, the point I'm making is about these legends. And so the American flag, for example, has got 13 uh, stripes on it, and that is representative of the 13 colonies that took on, in their view, the tyranny of the British, kicked them out. And consequently, when you look at that flag, what you're seeing is uh, an example of fighting tyranny in the name of freedom. Now, if you're anti-American, you look at the American flag and you might see something different, but it doesn't alter the fact that for most Americans, what they're looking at is the story and the history of their country, which they, most of them are exceptionally patriotic about, and it all goes back to the, this, these founding tales of when, when they fought the British. Uh, the stars are on the, the left-hand side, left-hand corner, top corner, uh, and they just added a star each time a new state joined the Union. Originally, they were going to add a new stripe, but it looked, it looked a bit silly. Um, actually, just uh, just this um, weekend, Puerto Rico voted to become the 51st state. Uh, it's not going to happen. Congress aren't going to allow it. But if they did, they'd just stick an extra uh, star on there. And if the UK was to become the 52nd, another one. <laughs> so they would. Which American state has the Union Jack on its flag? Ah, good pub quiz question. Yeah. Which American state has the Union Jack on its flag? Who'd have thought it? Hawaii. Let me think. 1816, the King of Hawaii, he's very good friends with the Brits, and uh, he's looking around, and he's also very good friends with the Americans, and he came up with a flag that was a bit like both. You've got some stripes, on, on uh, like the American stripes, but in the top left, you've got the Union Jack. It all got a bit sticky about two decades later. There was a captain on a British warship that hadn't got the memo that our parliament had just sworn everlasting loyalty, not loyalty, but uh, friendship with uh, Hawaii, and he was busy threatening to bombard them um, unless they took that flag down and put up the Union Jack, which luckily the king of Hawaii did. But about two weeks later, an admiral showed up and, you know, the, the, the email hadn't got through because it was the 1800s, and said, what the hell are you doing? The king very, very nicely said, no harm done, we'll, we'll take the flag back. And that is why, to this day, over sovereign American territory, the Union Jack flies proudly. Story. Wow, <laughs> story. A flag can sometimes tell a story... And, and maybe we could just finish with the story of the skull and crossbow. It's mm. such an obvious flag. But rather cheerfully, the origins of the skull and crossbow <laughs> seem to lie in necrophilia. Yeah, well, you really want to go there? I suppose this is, uh, oh, up, yeah, this well, is up all it's, night, yeah? It's late at night, yeah. Well. <laughs> Once upon a time, the, the, the greatest pirate conglomeration was actually the Knights Templar. I mean, in our... In our Legends. They were sort of good guys. They were actually a, a nasty bunch of pirates, the Knights Templar. Certainly had the biggest fleet around about the 12th century after the Crusades. Uh, they had a legend that um, a young man took quite a shine to a woman, didn't go very well, she ended up dying. He went back a year later in order to, um, shall we say, consummate his passion mm -hmm. and um, found the bones in, in that, that certain structure, that, that shape, that pattern... And that became a legend within the, the Knights Templar. As they were pirates, they started flying this flag. Um, now, what it then became known as for all people that took it up, pirates everywhere, and that it did go around the world, was, we're coming to rob you. And they used to run up a black flag alongside it and that meant if you run away, and we, well, I think it's called sail away in naval terms. Yeah, yeah. If you run away and we catch you, we're going to kill every last one of you. If you stay and hand over everything, it'll be fine. And there's also the skull and crossbones with the hourglass uh, motif. And that meant time's running out, guys. And the point of all this, as well as being a weird story of necrophilia, is that you don't need to speak or read or write a word of anyone's language. It's just there. You know exactly what's coming for you. So, again, I'll end where we started. The flag speaks to you. You know, it, it is a two-way process. How scary is it? How much am I afraid of it? Make your decisions, what you feel about it. And if you've got a really fast ship, get out of there. 
And that's Tim Marshall. His book is called Worth Dying For, The Power and the Politics of Flags. And it's